Today, negative rates, here we come. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, the cards are being dealt and the signals are being made. And the bad news is that I think negative interest rates will be coming and probably sooner than expected. And savers probably will have to start paying to hold their money in the banks. Now, this is, of course, very bad news, but... I think you have to read the tea leaves now from Phil Lowe, who gave this speech yesterday entitled The Recovery from a Very Uneven Recession. So this speech was given yesterday at City's 12th Annual Australia and New Zealand Investment Conference in Sydney. So he starts off by saying that the recovery ahead is actually going to be very patchy and uneven. He makes the point that all recessions are uneven, but this one will be especially so. And he then goes through some of the data to underscore just how uneven this is going to be. The first chart shows the fall in employment that occurred between February and May for different age groups and the recovery through to August. And the picture is pretty clear. The job losses have been largest for young people, with around 500,000 people under 35 losing their jobs in the early stages of the pandemic. And around 300,000 are still out of work. And he also analyses the data by industry, the hospitality industry in which many young people and women work have been worst affected, with almost 300,000 job losses between February and May. And there's been an encouraging recovery of late, he said. And for this to be sustained, the economy will need to open up further. In contrast, a number of other areas, including the finance industry, the public sector and mining, have been much less affected. One of the consequences of these developments, he said, is that people who work in lower paid occupations have on average been hit the hardest. And that's evidence from this chart, which shows the decline in employment has been largest for occupations with the lowest hourly earnings, while employment has actually increased for occupations with highest hourly earnings. And in fact, the difference in experience is very striking. And then he turns to small businesses, which he says has been hit larger than large businesses. As at mid-September, the number of people on the payrolls of firms with at least 200 employees was down just 1% on the level of mid-March. But in contrast, payrolls are down 7% on average for firms with between 20 and 200 employees, with a similar decline for firms with fewer than 20 employees. And that's consistent with my data, which shows considerable pressure on small businesses at the moment. And one of the items that he highlighted was the spread of retail sales going to large firms, which has risen quite considerably. That includes things like home office equipment and electronics and groceries. But cinemas and many restaurants have had very difficult times. So small firms have been much harder hit. And looking across the states and territories, in the first couple of months, all jurisdictions were affected broadly in the same way, with the number of payroll jobs falling between 7 and 9 percent everywhere. But since then, labour market conditions have diverged very significantly. And he goes on to say that the recovery was strongest in Western Australia, so much so that in their business liaison, they are hearing reports of some labour shortages. Consistent with the labour market data, retail spending, consumer confidence and house building has also picked up more in Western Australia than elsewhere. And of course, that is partly driven by the Home Builder Initiative, where $55,000 is available between state and federal support for new home and land packages. But at the other end of the distribution is Victoria, where the second wave has meant that the earlier recovery in jobs has been reversed, with the number of jobs there still down by 8% from that in March. And retail spending in Victoria in August was also 11% lower 
than at the start of the year. In contrast, spending in the rest of the country was up by 13%. And he poses the question of how willing people and businesses will be able to draw on their accumulated financial buffers to spend and invest over the months ahead. One of the many unique features of this recession is that it has been associated with a big increase in household savings. This is unusual. Normally, during a recession, incomes fall, and many people draw on their savings to get through the hard times. But in the June quarter, when fears about the pandemic were at their peak, household saving ratios surged to 20%. That's the highest in almost 50 years. But of course, that is very much associated with considerable amounts of government stimulus and support from job keeper, job seeker, superannuation withdrawals, etc., etc. So this was very much engineered by the government intervention. Now, he says there may be two factors at work here. The first is that Australians were more cautious and had fewer opportunities to spend given that many services were simply unable to be offered. As these opportunities disappeared, households did adjust their spending patterns, spending more on electronics and exercise equipment and online. But, he said, this substitution was not enough to offset the very large drop in spending on services that was a record decline in consumption in the June quarter. The second factor was the large boost to incomes from the various government support programmes, social assistance benefits, including the job seeker payments, increased by nearly $15 billion in the June quarter. In addition, businesses received more than $30 billion in job keeper payments to support the wages of their staff. Those payments are equivalent to around 15% of total household disposal income in the typical quarter. And postscript on that, don't forget the massive super withdrawals too. Many households, he said, have used this extra income and their increased savings to put their balance sheet on a firmer footing. Some of the money withdrawn from superannuation funds under the early release scheme, which is now equivalent to about an additional 10% of quarterly household disposal income, has also been used to pay down debt and strengthen cash buffers. The impact of this can be seen in some of the banking data over recent months, there have been record rates of repayment on personal credit cards and other forms of personal debt. Interest-bearing credit card balances have fallen by 22% since March and are now at their lowest level in around 15 years. And for many people with a mortgage, much of the extra savings and some of the superannuation withdrawals have been used to increase their balances in their offset accounts, with offset balances up 10% since March. Other people have simply paid down principal directly. Combined, all forms of mortgage payments, including additional balances in offset accounts, reached a record high over recent months, despite repayments being deferred on around 8% of housing loans. So he says the question that will be raised by all this is what are people going to do with this extra saving and improved debt situation? In aggregate, household income is likely to decline in the December quarter as the unemployment rate increases and government support becomes more targeted. In normal times, a decline in income would be expected to affect consumption, but these, he says, are not normal times. It is entirely possible that as restrictions ease, people will choose to draw on their accumulated buffers to sustain and increase their spending. Many businesses face a similar choice to households. Many have boosted their cash buffers over the past six months and face a decision about what to do with these. Do they sit on the buffers? in case something goes wrong, or use them for investment and expansion. I'd also make the point, by the way, that many small businesses have no buffers and are very close to the edge. It's interesting he didn't really call that out. The better outcome for the economy, he said, is for households and businesses to keep spending and investing. The question, of course, is will they? And the key to this is confidence in the health situation and the future state of the economy. If people are nervous about the health situation or the job prospects, they are likely to sit on their savings. On the other hand, if they're confident that the virus can be contained and that they have a job, they'll be more likely to spend. This means that there are large payoffs to be had from ensuring public confidence in the capacity of the health system to respond. From this perspective alone, there are likely to be large returns from public investments in first-class testing, contact tracing and quarantine arrangements. These are essential, he said, 
not only to open up our economy successfully, but also to build the confidence required for people to spend and invest. And then he turns his attention to economic policy. He said the policy response to the pandemic has been central to getting the Australian economy through the past six months in better shape than the economies of many other countries. In previous downturns, it was monetary policy that played the leading role, but this time it has been fiscal policy which has taken the lead. This switch, he says, is entirely appropriate given the pandemic and the low interest rate world that we're living in. The fiscal response has been critical in helping build that bridge to the recovery. The income support provided by the government has assisted many people get through this difficult period kept many businesses afloat and reduced some of the unevenness of the pandemic. Fiscal policy has been supported in this effort by monetary policy, he said, and by the actions of the banks and the financial regulators. The recent budget provided welcome further support to the economy. The various measures will provide ongoing support to disposable incomes and help boost aggregate demand. Policies of a structural nature will also help build the road to the recovery. And he said, I expect that this will help reinforce what I hope to be improving confidence on the health front. And he makes the point that the Australian government can borrow at the lowest rates ever. And the demand from investors for government bonds remains very strong. And the state and territories can also borrow at record low rates and have an important role to play in the national fiscal response. And compared with many other countries, the total government gross debt is comparatively low in Australia compared with many other countries. And he said, no doubt there will be a point in the future when attention will need to return to the task of rebuilding our fiscal buffers to deal with the next downturn. That task will be easier when the additional government spending is temporary in nature. In any case, the best way to rebuild those buffers is through economic growth. This means that structural reforms that drive that growth need to remain on the national agenda. And then he turned to monetary policy and discussed the package of measures announced in March, including the target for the yield on three-year Australian government bonds, which led to the low funding and borrowing costs. And that eased the burden of the pandemic for many people. The RBA's open market operations and the term funding facility have also both contributed to a plentiful supply of liquidity in the Australian financial system. And this is supporting the supply of credit to households and businesses. This supply of credit will be important in the recovery phase. And these measures to support the Australian economy have resulted in a very large increase in the RBA's balance sheet. Between 2016 and earlier this year, the balance sheet averaged around $170 billion. It's almost double that now at over $300 billion. Now, this is where it gets interesting because he then refers to the September meeting where the Reserve Bank decided to expand the term funding facility to provide banks with additional low cost funding equivalent to 2% of the total lending. And the timing of the decision coincided with the approach of the deadline for final drawings under the initial allocations under the facility. As ADIs draw on the extended facility, there will be a further significant expansion of the bank's balance sheet. And this expanded facility should be seen as a further easing of monetary policy, although in a different way than in the past. And he went on to say that at its most recent meeting, the board continued to consider the case for additional monetary easing to support jobs and the overall economy. As part of this discussion, they considered the nature of the forward guidance regarding the cash rate. And before turning to the broader policy question, he discussed how the board's thinking on forward guidance has evolved. Over recent months, the communication has stated that the board will not increase the cash rate target before progress is being made towards full employment and is as confident that inflation will be sustainably within the 2-3% target band. It might seem strange to some that we're even talking about the day that interest rates increase, given that it is a long way off. But expectations about future interest rates affect people's decisions and asset pricing, so that he says we seek to be as transparent as we reasonably can. And he went on to say that in terms of inflation, the forward guidance 
has been forward looking. They focused on the outlook for inflation, not just current inflation. That, he said, was a sensible approach when the inflation dynamic was relatively stable and well understood. In today's world, things are much less certain. So we will now be putting a greater weight on actual, not forecast, inflation in our decision making. Now that is a significant and important change and in my view mirrors the messaging from the Fed quite recently when they essentially were targeting inflation rather differently and more aggressively than in the past. In other words, the Reserve Bank is going to want to see inflation come through and indeed will be holding rates low for longer to try and achieve that. That is a big deal. And anyway, it's on to say in terms of unemployment, we want to see more than just progress towards full employment. The board views addressing the high rate of unemployment as an important national priority. Consistent with the mandate, we want to do what we can with the tools we have to ensure that people have jobs. We want to see a return to labour market conditions that are consistent with inflation being sustainably within 2 to 3% of target range. And so he went on to say the board will not be increasing the cash rate until actual inflation is sustainably within the target range. It is not enough for inflation to be forecast to be in the target range. While inflation can move up and down for a range of temporary reasons, achieving inflation consistent with the target is likely to require a return to a tight labour market. And he said, in our current outlook for the economy, which we will update in November, this is still some years away. So we do not expect to be increasing the cash rate for at least three years. And now he turns to the very important question of what else can they do? Turning to the broader policy question, we've been considering what more we can do to support jobs, incomes and businesses in Australia to help build that important road to recovery. The options have been laid out in previous speeches by the Deputy Governor and also himself, and he doesn't elaborate on those again. While the board has not yet made any decisions, he said, I thought it would be useful to close today by highlighting three of the many issues we're working through. The first is how much traction any further monetary easing might get in terms of better economic outcomes. When the pandemic was at its worst and there were severe restrictions on activity, he says, we judged that there was little to be gained from further monetary easing. The solutions to the problems the country faced lay elsewhere. As the economy opens up, though, it is reasonable to expect that further monetary easing would get more traction than was the case earlier. The second issue is the possible effect of further monetary easing on financial stability and longer term macroeconomic stability. This is an issue which we've paid close attention to in the past when we were considering reducing interest rates in a relatively robust economic environment. It remains an important issue today, but the considerations have changed somewhat, he said. To the extent that an easing of monetary policy helps people get jobs, it will help private sector balance sheets and lessen the number of problem loans. In so doing, it will reduce financial stability risk. This benefit needs to be weighed against any additional risks as people take more investment risk in the search for yield. And we need to take into account the effect of low interest rates on people who rely on interest income. Well, if you check the interest rate on your savings recently, it's almost at zero already, of course. And the third issue is what is happening internationally with monetary policy. Australia is a mid-sized open economy in an interconnected world. So what happens abroad has an impact here on both our exchange rate and yield curve. In the past, the interest differentials provided a reasonable gauge to the relative stance of monetary policies across countries. Today, things are not so straightforward with monetary policy also working through balance sheet expansion. As he noted earlier, the balance sheet here at the RBA has increased considerably since March, but larger increases have occurred in other countries. And so he said, we're considering the implications of this as we work through our options. So he says there are three. Now, this speech was recognised, for example, by Westpac as a game changer speech. And 
The Westpac said predictably his insights into the uneven recession were refreshingly revealing. He particularly highlighted the strengthening of household and business balance sheets. And the key question, which is, of course, what people are going to do with the extra savings and improved debt situation. But, said Westpac, in his speech, the important insights into the economy, as valuable as they always are, were overshadowed by his announcements around policy. The comments have a Jackson Hole feel about them, coming not coincidentally a few months after Chairman Powell signalled a more patient approach to the inflation target, now targeting inflation at 2% on average over the cycle. The conclusion from both speeches, Westpac said, is that we can expect policy to remain stimulatory for even longer. And Westpac went on to say that the drop from 0.25% to 0.1% of the cash rate is almost certain to appear in early November. But if you read the tea leaves, as I've been doing, it signals more significant issues too. Almost certainly we'll end up with negative interest rates in the months ahead, despite the fact that the Reserve Bank quite recently continued to argue we weren't required to go down that route. And of course, low interest rates, no interest rates, negative interest rates are very, very adverse to savers. Now, many savers already are sitting on close to 0% returns on deposits. And we also know, by the way, that many people are drawing out funds, holding $100 bills, for example, in safety deposit boxes to basically keep money out of the system. And it does beg the question, if you've got savings with no interest rates, what do you do? Just remember this, that in Germany and other places around the world where negative interest rates have followed, you actually end up having to pay to hold money in the bank. And it's my own expectations that we will end up there quite soon. The broader point is also the fact that the Reserve Bank and the other regulators will continue to support the banking system, will continue to drive interest rates lower, and will continue to provide ever more liquidity to the banks to allow them to lend. As I said yesterday, of course, it all depends on whether people borrow more, because if in fact borrowing is not fired up, then this whole plan fails, despite huge amounts of government debt. And before I finish today, I just want to discuss another article which was discussed in the Australian Financial Review. This was Wayne Byers speaking in a private briefing to bankers. There's no evidence, by the way, of this briefing on their public website at the moment, which is concerning. But nevertheless, this is very important because essentially there is a committed liquidity facility which was put in place at the time when there was perhaps less government debt than people wanted to see in Australia. And so the regulators argued for additional support from the Reserve Bank via APRA. And the article in the Fin Review said the banking regulators confirmed that it's preparing to roll back a special $240 billion liquidity facility in a shake-up that would prod banks to buy more ballooning government debt. Wayne Byers said the banks would soon need to rely a bit less on the unique committed liquidity facility, which is operated by the RBA. And he went on to say that as the stock of government debt rises, it was always going to be the case that the CLF would come down. The question we have to work through and are thinking about quite carefully is just how you want to make that transition happen and how far you want to go. Now, of course, the federal government last week forecast gross debt to rise to $1.1 trillion in 2023 and projected bonds on issue to hit $1.7 trillion by around 2030. More commercial bank buying of government bonds would help lower government borrowing costs. Now, local banks have been big buyers of public debt since the COVID-19 recession, adding to the 20% of federal government bonds and almost 50% of state government debt they held pre-crisis. 
The planned bank liquidity rule changes will be another example of banks and government financial regulators working through, together, to support the economy. And the RBA has already bought more than $60 billion of federal and state government bonds since March. So the article goes on to say that banks have also played a key role in the stealth quantitative easing via the RBA's enlarged $200 billion term funding facility, whereby the central bank offers cheap 0.25% three-year loans to commercial banks that use the money to buy government debt and earn a profitable yield. Under the current APRA rules, 15 local banks are required by APRA to hold a combined $478 billion of high-quality liquid assets that can be quickly converted in times of financial stress, including cash, central bank reserves and highly rated government bonds. But a previous shortage of government bonds, because of low levels of debt, caused the RBA to set up the CLF. And that now covers more than half of the bank's regulatory liquidity. The special deal allows banks to hold other private sector liquid assets, such as bank bonds and RMBS, and potentially swap those for cash from the RBA. Self-secured RMBS currently qualify, and banks paid $365 million in fees to the RBA to use the CLF in 2019. And, by the way, a change in the CLF would bring Australia into line with other advanced economies where debt levels have been higher and where there was an abundance of highly liquid government bonds. And bankers evidently have been in discussion with APRA about the looming change. So let me just underscore this. As well as taking interest rates down and down and down and probably into negative territory to try and force more lending through the system, the banks are also being supported directly through these changing processes. And essentially the banks are being encouraged to buy low-priced government bonds and state bonds to support their balance sheets. So this whole situation is one of trying to support the banking system. But the bottom line to me is this. Sure, you may be able to get a cheaper loan if you want to get that loan. But what about savers? But what about the 3 million plus savers who've been very reliant on income from deposits? Well, they are continuing to be taken to the cleaners. We've already seen changes in terms and conditions from a number of lenders, which allows lenders to basically put those deposits at risk. And we're now also seeing the rates going to the point where they will be at zero or close to zero. So that means that savers will have nowhere to run unless they are prepared to take higher risk investment options, be it shares or something else. This is a disaster for those 3 million plus households. And I'm afraid that this myopic approach from the regulators and from the central bank and the fixation on ever more debt is going to lead us into this blind alley of negative interest rates and, frankly, as I discussed yesterday, probably a deflationary future, not an inflationary future. But the die is cast, the signals have been made and expect rates to be cut to 0.1% cash rate in early November. There is, in my view, no way back from this. And therefore, we continue to see more signals of economic trouble ahead. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.